Um, but I am, besides being at the National Archives and on the board of the Lincoln Institute, a member of the board of the Illinois State Society. And on behalf of the Illinois State Society, I have the privilege of welcoming you. I also have the privilege of introducing Douglas L. Wilson. I followed Professor Wilson's career since the fall of 1961 when he was an assistant professor of English at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. As part of his journey to become one of the most renowned historians of Abraham Lincoln here in the United States, one essential stop was at the manuscript division of the Library of Congress, where he and his colleague, Rod Davis, effectively mined the rich collection of reminiscences that William Herndon had collected for his most recent book, Professor Davis has mined yet another collection, the Abraham Lincoln Papers at the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress. The papers were open to researchers in 1947, but it is only now that they have gotten through their eminent man of letters, a scholar who could and would give justice to Lincoln's words. I give you, wherever you are, Professor Wilson. Thanks very much, Rod. What Rod didn't tell you, maybe I shouldn't say this, is that uh, the reason he's been observing my career since 1961 is that he was a student at Knox College at that time. <laughs> It's a great honor to be on this program, the uh, Abraham uh, Lincoln Institute Symposium, because it's had an impressive record year after year of living up to its stated goal of spotlighting the latest developments in Lincoln scholarship. But in featuring the authors of new books, it does present those authors with a special challenge as my colleagues on the program are all too well aware. Do we present a summary of the content of our books? This was tempting, but it's difficult to do in 35 minutes. Another approach is to read from the book itself to give the flavor and texture and perhaps a glimpse of some of the topics and treatments. Another choice would be to highlight certain ideas or themes, conclusions that are featured in the book, Perhaps the most satisfactory options, and probably the one most often attempted in these situations. But what about the many people who attend these meetings who have already read the book? How are they served by any of these approaches, other than being enlightened as to what the author actually looks like, <laughs> whether older or younger than one imagined? or whether their arguments sound as silly or as sound in person as they do on the page. One's reminded of the story of a young faculty member at the University of Chicago in the 1970s taking her mother to the faculty club for lunch and proudly being able to point out two Nobel Prize winners, Saul Bellow and Milton Friedman, along with the former president of the university, Edward Levy, who was then serving as Attorney General of the United States. Upon leaving, the woman asked her mother, who had not seemed much impressed, what she thought of seeing such distinguished men at lunch. And her mother replied, But honey, they're all so short. I'm going to attempt a combination of the second and third approaches, reading from parts of the book itself and highlighting along the way a few things that I discovered in the process of researching and writing my book that seem notable. I'm going to begin by reading from the prologue of the book, which is the best way I could think of to open up the subject for you and give you a sense of what the book is about. In the four years that Abraham Lincoln would be president, the American public would gradually discover 
much to its collective astonishment, that this unprepossessing Illinois politician had remarkable powers as a writer. In that brief period, and in the midst of a relentless siege of crises and distractions, he would produce not one or two examples of provocative writing, which would itself be more than most presidents could manage, but a whole series of unmistakably impressive documents. Even though confined to such unpromising formats as ceremonial speeches, messages to Congress, proclamations, and public letters in newspapers, Lincoln's presidential writing proved to be timely, engaging, consistently lucid, compelling in argument, and most important of all, invested with memorable and even inspiring language. Eventually, it began to be recognized that Lincoln's unsuspected literary talent was having a decisive effect in shaping public attitudes and was a telling factor in the success of his policies. Only with his death, however, did it begin to dawn on his contemporaries that Abraham Lincoln's words were destined to find a permanent place in the American imagination. All of this came to the American public, and particularly to members of the American intelligentsia, as a revelation. His nomination for the presidency over more familiar and established candidates had been a disappointment, to say the least, to the literati. The verdict of Charles Francis Adams, son and grandson of presidents and a leading Republican, was typical. Good-natured, kindly, honest, but frivolous and uncertain. The last thing the intellectual establishment looked for from this folksy, self-educated prairie politician was literary ability. Perhaps no point in the career of Abraham Lincoln has excited more surprise or comment, wrote John G. Nicolay, than his remarkable power of literary expression. As Lincoln's private secretary and later biographer, Nicolay had witnessed the unfolding of this surprising phenomenon at first hand, a phenomenon that continued to mystify the learned long after Lincoln's death. Quoting again, it is a constant puzzle to many men of letters how a person growing up without the advantages of schools and books could have acquired the art which enabled him to write the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural, end quote. They could accept that such a man might be an exceptional storyteller or a stump speaker, but writing, especially writing of a high order, was somehow different. For Nicolay, this was not so much a mystery as a fact. Quote, the remarkable thing, he wrote, was that while nature and opportunity gave him talent and great success at storytelling and extemporaneous talking, he learned to write, learned to appreciate the value of the pen as an instrument to formulate and record his thought and the more clearly, forcibly, and elegantly to express it. Nicolay's verdict, or something like it, would eventually be accepted by the American public and even by the world at large. Lincoln has thus become one of the most admired of all American writers. Quoting, Alone among American presidents, Edmund Wilson has written, it's possible to imagine Lincoln, grown up in a different milieu, becoming a distinguished writer of not merely a political kind. If one were to judge the importance of a writer by the familiarity of his words, and the depth of meaning and feeling that they evoke, few, if any, American writers could compare with him. But for all this implicit recognition of his literary abilities, Lincoln's standing as a great national hero, war president, savior of the Union, emancipator, man of the people, is such that he is still not widely or well understood as a writer. His background in writing, for example, began in his childhood and was far more extensive than is usually recognized. For much of his adult life, contributions to newspapers were habitual, encompassing a considerable body of lively political writing 
much of which, having been printed anonymously and pseudonymously, will probably never be recovered. Famous in the 1850s for his speeches and ability on the platform, as in his debates with Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln was always carefully prepared, many of his arguments and positions written out and polished in advance. He lives in legend as a trial lawyer who was successful before juries, but his skills as an appeals lawyer whose arguments were submitted in writing to a panel of judges, though less recognized, may have been more impressive. His surviving personal papers attest that he was, from the time he began to preserve them in the 1840s, a careful and conscientious draftsman who knew the value of revision. And yet, well as we think we know the essential character of this most written about of all Americans, his habits and practice as a lifelong writer have scarcely been explored. Writing is admittedly a solitary activity. While artists have made it possible to summon up a picture of Lincoln reading by firelight, swinging an axe, or speaking from a platform, depictions of him working at his writing desk are rare. An exception is provided by the president's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, who late in life sent a correspondent this word picture of his father at work. He was a very deliberate writer, anything but rapid. I cannot remember any peculiarity about his posture. He wrote sitting at a table, as I remember, in an ordinary posture. As to dictation, I never saw him dictate to anyone, and it certainly was not his practice to do so. He seemed to think nothing of the labor of writing and was accustomed to make many scraps of notes and memoranda. In writing a careful letter, he wrote it, he wrote it himself, then corrected it, then rewrote the corrected version. Though not a familiar pose, this is nonetheless a revealing picture. Perhaps most striking is Robert's identification of a distinctive characteristic that is very little recognized, that even though a slow and very deliberate writer, Lincoln was not in the least put off by what most people consider the onerous labor of writing. For anyone interested in Abraham Lincoln's presidential writing, this is an important point to keep in mind. Lincoln's presidency, as is well known, was extraordinarily crisis-ridden and hectic. In spite of his surface calm and good-natured demeanor, his performance in office was totally engaged. While never well-organized or systematic, he was, in fact, an energetic, hands-on, detail-oriented administrator. If any president's performance in office deserved the overused epithet indefatigable, it was his. His willingness to make time for ordinary members of the public and hear personal requests is well known. He kept extremely close tabs on military developments, spending a substantial amount of time in the telegraph office of the War Department. Though the demands of the patronage system drove him almost to distraction, he insisted on involving himself personally in the contentious process of sorting out the competing claims of hundreds of applicants for government posts. One has only to peruse his personal papers, most of which are on view the Library of Congress website, to get some idea of the amazing number of details that received his personal attention. The testimony of those who saw him regularly is replete with confirming evidence of Lincoln's exertions. As is often pointed out, the physical toll that these efforts exacted is visible in the photographs taken over the course of his four years in office. He kept longer hours and in almost every way outworked his subordinates which prompted an old friend and frequent visitor, Joshua Speed, to inquire about it. I remember asking him on one occasion when he slept. His answer was, just when everybody else is tired out. <laughs> In the midst of all this exertion, Lincoln found an astonishing amount of time to write. In fact, no small amount of, the, of his total overall effort was given over to writing. Published items from his hand as president and collected works run into the thousands. 
and recent searches in the National Archives indicate that there are many more that have gone unrecorded. And I suspect in the years to come in this forum, we're going to be hearing more and more about these new searches in the National Archives. As these discoveries show, Lincoln not only sent a constant stream of small notes and endorsement to various government officials, he sometimes drafted complicated documents that were issued over the signature of subordinates. He wrote frequently to his generals as a way of keeping in touch and offering advice. It's indicative that his reaction to his first taste of military defeat, the disastrous battle of Bull Run, first Bull Run, his reaction to this defeat was to take up his pen, and he stayed up all night to set down on paper what needed to be done to redeem the situation. In short, he responded to almost every important development during his presidency, and to many that were not so important, with some act of writing. Except for ceremonial proclamations, he seems to have delegated relatively little official writing and rarely dictated the documents that went out over his signature. By almost any means of gauging his presidential activity, it becomes apparent that writing, both the activity and its products, was indispensable to Lincoln's way of performing his office. But writing, especially the drafting of a consequential text, usually requires time, quiet, and an absence of interruptions, the very things that Lincoln most often lacked. How did he manage this? Another recollection of Joshua Speed's helps to explain how so much writing was possible. He had a wonderful faculty in that way, Speed recalled. He might be writing an important document, be interrupted in the midst of a sentence, turn his attention to other matters entirely foreign to the subject on which he was engaged, and take up his pen and begin where he left off without reading the previous part of the sentence. But the record also reveals that Lincoln frequently sought sanctuary in the telegraph office, at the soldier's home, and even behind the usually open doors of his own office to immerse himself in his writing. Indeed, there's more than a little to suggest that writing was often a form of refuge for Lincoln, a place of intellectual retreat from the chaos and confusion of office where he could sort through conflicting options and order his thoughts with words. As president, Abraham Lincoln was not a national hero. For most of his presidency, he was beset by critics on all sides. He found himself operating in a perpetual crossfire from congressmen, governors, generals, office seekers, ordinary citizens, all dissatisfied, and many sincerely convinced that he was incompetent and leading the nation down the path of destruction. His writings were an important part of his effort to respond to this pressure. His achievement is all the more remarkable when we consider that many of the presidential writings for which Lincoln is best known, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Gettysburg Address, the Second Inaugural, were formulations of ideas and positions that were not immediately popular, that they eventually came to be widely admired and even venerated is a tribute to Lincoln's rare combination of leadership and literary ability. Quoting, when we put ourselves back into the period, Edmund Wilson wrote in Patriotic Gore, we realize that it was not at all inevitable to think of it as Lincoln thought. And we come to see that Lincoln's conception of the course and meaning of the Civil War was indeed an interpretation that he partly took over from others, but that he partly made others accept, and in the teeth of a good deal of resistance on the part of the North itself. Wilson was no worshiper of Lincoln, but he knew forceful and effective writing when he saw it. He was satisfied that Lincoln had succeeded in molding American opinion, and that this was, quote, a matter of style and imagination, as well as moral authority, of cogent argument and obstinate will. One of the aims of my book is to shed light on the way and the extent to which Lincoln's writing contributed to this process 
that Edmund Wilson describes. To approach Lincoln's presidency from the aspect of his writing is to come to grips with the degree to which his pen, to alter the proverb, became his sword, arguably his most powerful presidential weapon. My book is about some of the products of that pen. It was first prompted by a three-year encounter with the Lincoln Manuscripts at the Library of Congress as part of a project to transcribe and annotate Lincoln's personal papers for posting on the library's website. As anyone with web access can readily discover, the documents in Lincoln's hand in this collection are numerous and diverse, but while enormously interesting in their own right, most are not, uh, most are not the kind of Lincoln document that the public is familiar with. Many are letters, but not the finished letters that were sent to the recipients. Rather, these are the handwritten drafts that Robert described his father as typically producing, showing the changes and revisions made in the process of composition. In most cases, Lincoln later copied the finished text with his own hand, sending the fair copies to the recipient and retaining the drafts for his files. For some of his most important speeches and messages, the Library of Congress collection has multiple versions showing the successive stages of revision that the document went through. Lincoln's papers, some of which are in other collections, tell us a great deal about his way of working, about his skills as a writer, and about the role that writing played in his presidency. In Lincoln's sword, the focus is often on these manuscripts. To explore Lincoln's presidential writing is to create, in effect, a window on his presidency and a key to his accomplishments. One of the dramas that this perspective brings into focus has already been referred to, the gradual realization by the public that its unprepossessing president was actually an accomplished writer. A parallel drama has to do with how the power of Lincoln's words gradually began to assert itself during the course of his presidency and how he sought to take more and more advantage of it. While blessed with considerable self-confidence, Lincoln did not think of himself as a great writer. His secretaries declared emphatically nothing would have more amazed him while he lived than to hear himself called a man of letters. Nonetheless, as a, rule, as a result of favorable reactions to things he had written, Lincoln eventually came to realize how effective he could be before the public in a literary medium. And as his writing was increasingly useful, a useful means to achieve presidential ends, it seemed certain that he began to see how it might play a larger role. By the time he came to write the Gettysburg Address, for example, he was attempting to help put the horrific carnage of the Civil War in a positive light, and at the same time to do it in a way that would have constructive implications for the future. By the time he came to write the second inaugural address, 15 months later, he was quite consciously in the business of interpreting the war and its deeper meaning, not just for his contemporaries, but for what he elsewhere called the vast future as well. From that time forward, Lincoln's most memorable writings have been at the heart of whatever positive writings, of whatever positive interpretation Americans have been able to put of the Civil War. In fact, it is by now hard to imagine how we, we, could, we could engage the question of what that terrible war was about without Lincoln's words. I'm going to stop reading from the prologue here and get into the highlights. I have, I have three highlights for it. There are many more highlights for those of you who haven't read the book, but here are three. A hidden asset. Lincoln's ability as a writer was considerable, and it had much to do with his becoming president, but it was a distinctly hidden asset. He had no reputation as a writer, not even among his friends, who thought of him instead as a first-rate thinker and speaker and debater. But behind all the successful arguing and speechifying that brought him to prominence in the 1850s was a facility for and a commitment to writing. From an early age, he developed the habit of putting his ideas down in, um, in a written form in order to try them out, to shape and reshape them, to see and especially to hear how they sounded. 
This was a habit that reliable evidence indicates went back to his childhood. As his presidency proceeded, he would make the same kind of use of his writing as he had in the past, and eventually the effects of his literary ability began to be felt. Strange as it seems to us, Lincoln's contemporaries, friend and foe alike, had great difficulty seeing this. It simply did not fit the picture that they had of him as a genial rube, honest, friendly, colorful of speech, but uneducated and thoroughly unrefined. Through this maze, much of it thrown up by Lincoln himself, most detected no sign of a gifted writer. A skeptical newspaper editor spoke the misgivings of many when he asked of the new president, who will write this ignorant man's state papers? This was the state of things when Lincoln came into office, and it persisted for much of his presidency. If something appeared over his signature that was undoubtedly able, it was often attributed to one of his talented cabinet members, usually uh, William H. Seward or Simon P. Chase. Some months after Edwin Stanton arrived at the cabinet, he met a former associate at the bar, George Herring, uh, Harding, who thought Stanton was more able than either Seward or Chase. Years earlier, when Lincoln had been hired as part of the same legal team on an important patent case in Cincinnati, Harding and Stanton had callously humiliated the man they thought of as the Illinois gorilla, Abraham Lincoln. Referring to one of Lincoln's recent state papers, Harding told Stanton that he knew who had actually authored it. Stanton. Not a word of it. Not a word of it was Stanton's answer. Lincoln, he said, wrote every word of it, and he is capable of more than that. Harding, no men were ever so deceived as we at Cincinnati. <laughs> Number two, the public letters. It can be argued that this lack of recognition served Lincoln well, especially in the case of his public letters, which were themselves unprecedented and whose appearance were at first widely seen as more evidence that Lincoln lacked the requisite sense of presidential decorum. Just as a well-timed punch is more effective with an opponent who isn't expecting it, so Lincoln's public letters hit their target audience with maximum force. He happened onto them, it would seem, by accident. But it was probably inevitable that he would eventually find a way as president to communicate directly with the public. In the case of his public letters, there's evidence that most of them were substantially written or prepared for in advance. This is dramatically illustrated in the case of his first public letter, the famous one to Horace Greeley, in August of 1862. With his administration in the doldrums and his plan for an Emancipation Proclamation put on hold by failure on the battlefield, Lincoln characteristically took pen in hand and drafted a pithy defense of his policies, concentrating on the charge that he had not moved decisively against slavery. He had read a draft of what he had written to a friend and was casting about for a public venue in which to present his defense when Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, published a long and ill-tempered attack on him that he entitled the prayer of 20 millions. Poor Greeley. <laughs> Hoping to catch the president at a vulnerable moment, Greeley found himself instead almost immediately on the receiving end of a presidential salvo whose prose was so lean and crisp and memorable that it could be almost recited after a first reading. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. As we know, that's exactly what he was planning to do. And the, and the letter, even though people complained that it was unprecedented and undignified, uh, everybody had to agree it was... Everybody read it and everybody knew it. It was very important. Okay. Highlight number three, a long-headed man. 
While it's understandable to think of Lincoln's performance with his public letters as evidence of superior ability to react to criticism, close study of Lincoln's manuscripts and his practices as a writer suggests that this is a misunderstanding. One of the secrets of Abraham Lincoln's success was that he tended to do his reacting in advance. He was what his law partner, William H. Herndon, called long-headed. That is, he was constantly thinking about the direction in which things were headed. It says a lot about Lincoln that he was the kind of lawyer who began by first studying the opposing side of his case in great detail. I don't know if he really was, but he claimed he was at one point. To judge by the testimony of his closest colleagues, he raised anticipation to a fine art. What Lincoln had done in the case of the Greeley letter is an instance of the way he had been working for years, namely making notes, drafting responses to important questions in advance, so as to be fully prepared when an opportunity arose in which to present them. His partner Herndon described the way he composed his famous House Divided speech. He wrote that fine effort in slips, put those slips in his hat, numbering them, and when he was done with the ideas, he gathered up the scraps, put them in the right order, and wrote out his speech. All of this helps to explain his activity in the spring of 1863 that resulted in the reply to Erastus Corning and the Albany petitioners, in which he brilliantly defended his administration on the issue of the curtailment of civil liberties. An Iowa congressman, James F. Wilson, recalled that once while visiting the president's office, he'd complimented Lincoln on the letter to Corning and was rewarded with a description of how it came about. He then explained, Wilson wrote, how the paper had been prepared. Turning to a drawer in the desk at which he was sitting and pulling it partly out, he said, when it became necessary for me to write that letter, I had it nearly all in there, pointing to the drawer. But it was in disconnected thoughts, which I jotted down from time to time on separate scraps of paper. In Lincoln's sword, I try to show that there's evidence that most of his public letters, a new departure of presidential communication that did much to bring the public around to his policies, were exercises in what I call pre-writing. I try to make the case that this tells us not, about, not only about the kind of writer he was, but about the kind of leader he was who exemplified the quality that Shakespeare called readiness. Hamlet says, readiness is all. I want to leave you with the last uh, paragraph from the ep epigraph of my, ep epilogue of my book. George Santayana, the, the cosmopolitan Spanish philosopher who grew up in America and taught for a time at Harvard, offered many shrewd observations on American culture, including one on the role played by eloquence, which he insisted was a Republican as opposed to an aristocratic art. In a country where the important issues had to be aired and decided on a broad basis, it was by eloquence. In the pulpit, in the press, uh, or in public meetings, that a community could sometimes attain what Santayana called a notable elevation of thought. This experience was itself, according to Santayana, an important aspect of American life. Although Americans, this is Santayana, and many other people usually say that thought is for the sake of action, it was evidently in these high moments when action became incandescent in thought that they, that is Americans, have been most truly alive. This may help to explain the way millions of Americans and a surprising number of people around the world are affected by Abraham Lincoln's most inspired writing. Perhaps illuminates what visitors com commonly experience at the Washington Memorial, where they typically stand in silence and read the words of the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural, both of which are inscribed in their entirety on facing marble walls. Although shrines in the form of Greek temples and monumental statues are increasingly unlikely attractions for modern-day pilgrims, the Lincoln Memorial is an exception and continues to exercise a powerful emotional appeal. In experiencing these two high moments, something important is affirmed. For Americans, to be sure, this is an affirmation about themselves, their country, their history, their common values and beliefs, both realized and unrealized.
But in a larger sense, and one that was surely part of Lincoln's larger purpose, these high moments managed to reflect and symbolize all human striving. On one wall, it says that there must first be ideals, then dedication, then a willingness to sacrifice and to persevere. And on the other wall, it says that even in triumph, the victors share complicity with the vanquished. Thank you very much. I'm told to remind you that uh, if you want to uh, ask a question, you should go to the microphone. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Um, could you say more? D uh, could you tell us how you evaluate um, patterns in his writing? Um, did he use, is it poetic? Is it philosophical? Is it biblical? Did you see certain motifs that were predominant? I'd just like you to say more about the substance of his writing. Was Cicero a model for him in rhetoric and rhetoric and things like that? Just thanks. Uh, I, I don't say too much about that. I, I was afraid to get too much into a rhetorical um, uh, analysis. Uh, I do talk about, uh, as, as we come upon them, his favorite um, devices. And I doubt very much that Lincoln learned these out of rhetoric books, even the books that he read as a child, uh, which would have talked about rhetoric and which would have given names to the figures like antithesis and so forth. He knew what those things were instinctively, um, and he used them brilliantly. Um, but I don't think that it was, I don't think it was a theoretical application. I think it was having internalized um, ways. And I think his main way of doing it was through his ear. He had to read everything aloud. Um, he couldn't find anybody to read uh, one of his public letters to. All of his staff was out. So he cornered this clerk and sat him down. The clerk says, well, Mr. Lincoln, I, I can't criticize you. He said, just sit there and listen. I've got to have an audience. It doesn't matter. Uh, and he said that to several people. In other words, he had to hear it, and he had to hear it, and somehow it, the audience had to be real. But I do think that he was guided by his ear, um, and he, uh, he, he makes... Uh, well, let me give an example. He wrote out, he, he had the second inaugural all ready to go. He wrote it out in large writing. You could tell this is a, a reading draft. And then he decided he wanted to change the ending, the last sentence. So he took a slip and he pasted it over the last two lines and he wrote the new version. Now our friends at the Library of Congress are able to special uh, lights and cameras to photograph the paper in such a way that we can read what's underneath. And there's a picture of this in my book. The difference, he wasn't talking about changing the meaning at all or the emphasis. It was only changing the sound and the feel of the language, the fluency, I would say. You can look at it, it's in the book and decide for yourselves. But it was important enough for him to go to the trouble to paste a slip over the last two lines and, and write a new ending. So I, my sense of, of the way he, um, the guiding um, lights of his uh, writing is by having internalized this whole idea of cadence and rhythm and the sound and feel of words. That's what he has when he, in his great writing. Professor, thank you for a, a very engrossing and learned lecture. Your focus on Lincoln as a writer invites many questions about who his liter literary models were, about what, if anything, might be learned from an examination of his actual penmanship and what differences there might have been between Lincoln as a writer of words and Lincoln as the presenter of his own words as an orator. Um, but since I only have one question I can ask you, um, I would like to pose what I think is an historiographical question, which is, is Lincoln's scholarship at this point, at this great remove from the events themselves, akin to Bible study in the sense that 
all of the known materials are, are out there and we are left only not with investigative scholarship but with interpretive scholarship. And re regardless of your answer is yes or no to that question, what do you as the director of a, of a Lincoln Studies program uh, regard as the most fruitful future subjects for future scholars to undertake about Lincoln, be they investigative or interpretive? I, uh, I'm a proponent of the idea uh, and the belief that we are still accumulating and putting in a usable form the uh, materials for the study of Lincoln. I had the pleasure and the labor, and, and it was a labor, to, uh, took us several years to put together, uh, I think somebody referred to it earlier, the, the materials that Herndon collected, um, the, which is the basis of everything, almost everything we know about his early life. Herndon hadn't done that, we would have not. But those materials um, weren't really available and weren't available in a good, reliable, scholarly form with annotation and some information about who these people were. And uh, my colleague Rod Davis and I did that. And um, we hear all the time from people saying, I couldn't have written, I couldn't have got into what I'm doing now, I couldn't have had the insights I have uh, if I didn't have these materials. We think there, is more, there are more things of this sort that can be brought forward. So I think there are, it's, we're probably not going to find a huge batch of Lincoln originals, although keep your fingers crossed. Uh, we could. We do keep finding more things. We found his suicide poem a couple years ago. Um, um, and uh, I myself had the pleasure of uh, digging up a letter that he had written in an 1834 newspaper. There are still things to find. There's still materials. There's that. There's new materials. And then there's the shifting perspective of the generations. The questions that interest us won't be exactly the questions that interest the next generation, just as our interests, the questions that we ask of, of historical figures now would scandalize people of only a few generations back. We don't talk about those things, you know. Uh, but then we'd say, this generation says, no, we want to talk about those things. So I think the uh, serious study and discussion of Lincoln, uh, yeah, not only by scholars, but by this great audience of the public that's truly interested, um, will go on. So what areas do you think will, should future scholars be focusing on? Give us just a few. Well, I, I really have high hopes for these efforts that we've heard a few allusions to. Um, uh, what the material that can be recovered from the National Archives because we now have s people going through on a systematic basis looking um, through endless files for these kinds of material and they are finding things. William Seward draft made the first draft of the Better Angels of Our Nature first inaugural and Lincoln gave a sharpened, much sharpened version of that. Yeah. How much... Uh, Lincoln's writing seemed to be better during the presidential years than the Springfield years. Maybe it's just the, there was more urgency about it. But mm -hmm. is part, was part of the quality of the writing in the presidential years that he had people like Seward and Stanton and Chase around him to talk about and argue with? And how much credit should they be given? Or was there ever a collective process where he had four people in the room and it was really the product of about four or five people rather than just Lincoln himself? Those kind of questions. Well, th those are very good uh, questions. Uh, and I, I would say that I certainly think, I haven't set out to demonstrate it, I think it probably could be demonstrated uh, to some extent, that there's no question that the pressure um, that was put on Lincoln uh, is responsible for, for the quality uh, of, of his great writings. And that it was the absence of that pressure uh, that that the predecessor, the younger Lincoln, uh, didn't perform at that level. I mean, that would be my judgment. Um, he's, he's always, if you, if you look at, it, at the manuscripts, you just have to be struck with the fact that this is a writer. He's constantly writing. He's changing. Little, little things matter to him, uh, as well as larger revisions. So, um, uh, I think that the, the writer was there the interest in words goes back to his childhood. He was always interested in words. He was always interested in clarity. I'm sure a number of you know the, the anecdotes that tell us that in his childhood, um, and he remembered this, that he was interested. If 
nothing bothered him so much as words that he didn't understand and ideas or concepts that he didn't understand. His stepmother talks about how he, he was restless. He, he wasn't happy. He couldn't sit down unless he could clarify these things. Those things were with him all of his life. He had a great gift for words. Anybody who read the debates would see that here's a man with a gift for words. Uh, but it was the pressure of office that I think produced those great documents.